Thank you everybody for joining us here today. My goal today is to, as efficiently as possible, show you what information Ames Web Plus can provide and highlight some of the ways that this can be a flexible and efficient method of identifying students that need extra help and pinpointing exactly what type of help they might need. Students are gonna have a wide variety of needs returning this fall and as unprepared as everyone might feel, many schools in the US have already began implementing a system for supporting students like response intervention or multi-tiered system of support. And they've been doing it successfully for many years. And while things are different this fall, the existing infrastructure here can be expanded and applied to meet the current situations. And while there's no way to be 100% prepared, obviously, for every situation we might encounter this fall, I do think it's important to recognize the ways in which we actually are a little prepared for this. So within the MTSS system, educators are asked to look at the needs of the whole child to focus on academics, behavior, social, emotional, and look at those in tandem because the research has shown that these are very much interrelated. For example, there is a 2008 study out of Penn State University showing that students with reading problems in first grade were more likely to exhibit behavioral and social emotional difficulties by third grade and vice versa. Then there's a 2011 meta-analysis involving 213 schools that took a universal approach to teaching the social, emotional, and behavioral skills needed they saw an average of an 11 percentile increase on academic performance. Ames Web Plus was designed to be a data source that can drive such an MTSS model. It speaks to all components of this whole child lens by providing assessment across these three areas. So we're gonna start by just kind of focusing on an overview. Um, Ames Web Plus offers assessment suites for early literacy, early numeracy, reading, and math. And of course, behavior and dyslexia add-ons as well. Ames Web Plus uses a combined approach to assessment that includes curriculum-based measurement as well as standards-based assessment. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a little bit. Finally, Ames Web Plus is meant to be a driving data source in your RTI and MTSS process. It provides a consistent data source to compare interventions and maybe changes in curriculum. And it also provides some diagnostic information to help inform instruction. Additionally, Ames Web Plus is a research-based approach to assessment and it has all the metrics that are aligned with the assessment quality indicators put in place by the Standards for Educational and Psychological Testing, the Joint Committee that was established in 2014. And so we really want to ensure that Ames Web Plus meets validity, reliability, and fairness standards, that Ames Web Plus measures what it says it measures on its different assessments, that it can produce consistent and reliable results, and that the scores are going to have the same intended meeting for all students, and there's no biased results against any particular group of people. So Ames Web Plus has two kind of main components within the system. There's a benchmarking or universal screening component, and there's also progress monitoring available as well. So we're gonna talk first about benchmarking and universal screening. Our benchmark assessments occur three times per year, fall, winter, and spring. If you're using Ames Web Plus as your universal screener, you're going to benchmark all the students in your school. Or we also have some districts that only use Ames Web Plus with targeted groups, like students that are in intervention or special education. In these cases, we still recommend benchmarking students three times per year. For the benchmark assessment, you're always going to be assessing on grade level skills. And this is somewhat unique compared to some of the options out there. The way we have approached this is on an on-grade level assessment. So your third graders are taking third grade skills, your fifth graders take fifth grade skills and so on. Uh, we think it's really important if we're going to be evaluating the effectiveness of our curriculum and how our students are learning those on-grade level expectations, we need to assess them directly on what they've learned. Similarly, 
if we're trying to close the gap for a student, while we may want to see how they're doing at that instructional level, it's also important to see how their inclusion time is allowing them to get that on grade level skills as well. So three times a year, we're going to be looking on grade level through these benchmark assessments. These results are going to allow you to compare results to the targets set within your district and identify students that might need additional support. And that's where progress monitoring will come in. So for students that maybe are below the expectations for their grade level, you're going to have the ability to progress monitor them. And these are shorter, brief assessments that you can do in between those benchmark periods. The great thing about AMSWA Plus Progress Monitoring is instead of being tied to the student's grade level, you're able to drill down to the student's instructional level. So even if there's several grade levels behind, you can drop down to that instructional level and you're able to zero in on only the skills that you're targeting an intervention. So where Benchmark is going to look at broad reading or broad math, Progress monitoring is going to strictly focus on one or maybe two skills that you're working on with that student. Therefore, these assessments are going to be very sensitive to change in a short amount of time. They're going to be efficient and brief to administer. So many of them are able to be done in only one to two minutes. These progress monitoring assessments, I think our longest one goes up to seven minutes. So all very brief and sensitive measures that are used to figure out whether or not an intervention is working. So let's back up for a second, just take a bird's eye view of how these components fit together. And so you're going to start with that benchmark screening three times a year, fall, winter, and spring. So you'll start with that in the fall. Then you're going to analyze that screening data. You're going to plan for instruction or intervention at um, the large group level, small group level, and individual level. For students receiving individualized or small group instruction, you're going to progress monitor them in between benchmark periods and adjust instruction as needed. Then come winter, you'll do another benchmark and reassess where you are and what changes need to be made. In order to understand the different measures that we're going to be assessing within AIMS Web Plus, it's really important to kind of understand our assessment framework. So many of you on the webinar today might be familiar with the classic version of AIMS Web. AIMS Web actually has been around for almost 20 years, and it's gotten a really great reputation from the use of curriculum-based measurement. Curriculum-based measurements involve the quick assessment of very isolated skills. So for example, letter naming fluency is a curriculum-based measurement. Oral reading fluency or math facts fluency are curriculum-based measurements. These assessments are brief to administer and they are hugely supported in research as effective screening measures even. For example, oral reading fluency has over a decade of research showing that it's incredibly predictive of a student's overall reading ability. However, I'm sure you can think of those students that have you know, great oral reading fluency, but they have no clue what they just read, right? And for these students, that old assessment model falls a little bit short and curriculum-based measurement doesn't tell the whole story. And so this is where the new assessment model comes into play. Ames Web Plus continues to have curriculum-based measurements because, you know, how could we not with all that research support and they continue to be stellar progress monitoring measures. However, now we also have mixed in standards-based assessments. And this allows us to assess some of those more complex and integrated skills like reading comprehension, vocabulary, standards-based math problem solving, all of these more in-depth kind of skills that are required on many of the end of the year assessments. We're able to include these, and this also you're going to notice, this allows us to have really rich reporting that goes in-depth and gives you some great information to differentiate instruction. When you administer an Angel Web Plus benchmark, you're going to be pulling from assessments that cover each of these types, curriculum-based measurement and standards-based assessment. 
So the full benchmark will include all of these and it will calculate an overall composite score for the student. And this composite score is gonna be your primary indicator that you use to evaluate overall risk for the student. So you get one composite score in the area of reading or early literacy, you'll get one composite score in the area of math or early numeracy. And you'll notice in several reports, this is how we, even at a large group level, are able to identify groups of students that might need additional support and allocate resources where they're needed. Okay, so let's talk about how some of the data is gathered within Ames Web Plus. So I'm gonna start out by talking about kind of typical administration, and then I'll talk a little bit about remote assessment as well. So in a typical administration, there are two main ways that we gather data. We use digital record forms and we use online assessments through TestNav. The digital record form assessment involves the student and teacher sitting one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and this is going to be primarily used with your pre-K through first grade students. And then for all grades, if you're assessing oral reading fluency. So the teacher will sit one-on-one -on -one with the student. The student will have likely a piece of paper in front of them that might have some letters, numbers, or words on it for them to, to read for the assessment. And then the teacher is going to have the digital record form on his or her side. This digital record form is going to show the teacher everything they need to do and say for a standardized administration. It's gonna auto score everything and basically walk the student and teacher through that assessment process. Then for the online assessments through TestNav, which is used for grades two and up for every measure except oral reading fluency, these online assessments are set up by the teacher. So the teacher will assign the student the assessment. The student will then log on to their device and open a software called TestNav. They'll have their own kind of unique login information or we also offer a single sign-on. And once they get in TestNav, and have a brief introduction by the teacher, TestNav software is going to basically walk them through the different components of that assessment. Same, th same thing, everything is automatically timed and scores. And for all of these, the reports are immediately available once you finish the assessment. So those are the two main ways that data is gathered within Ames Web Plus. You see this box at the bottom that talks about classic measures. In addition to these two main ways, we also have a few measures from classic Ames Web that have been retained for your use within Ames Web Plus. Some examples would be the reading maze assessment or the Ames Web Classic math concepts and applications assessment. That's a paper pencil administration. These are basically filling in a couple of needs that districts may have. For example, if student over second grade can't take this online assessment for whatever reason, maybe a disability, you do have some of these paper pencil options available so that you can gather data on that student. It's important to know that these measures, the classic measures and the Ames Web Plus measures are not exactly the same assessment. These classic measures are more of a supplemental resource to be used in you know, as needed cases. Okay, so that was the typical administration of Ames Web Plus. And of course, this year is a little bit different. Um, so we need to talk about remote assessment options as well. In light of the current challenges, the Ames Web Plus team has provided some best practice guidelines to support your district if you choose to move forward with remote assessments. So when thinking back to you know how we administer these, I'm, I'm sure, Administering that computer-based assessment to students at home is probably something that you can easily wrap your head around. Although there are a few special guidelines for this, the largest difference is going to be for those younger students. Adapting that one-on-one -on -one assessment to a virtual environment it's a little bit more involved, but certainly one that can be accomplished. Uh, we actually did have several districts use this for their benchmark assessment in the spring. And within the platform, uh, within the Ames Web Plus platform, we have several resources that can help support you. 
Uh, for example, we have video tutorials, some guides, a checklist for facilitators and uh, examiners to help make sure that all of the environments and different things have been planned for prior to sitting down during that assessment session. And it's important to mention that these resources are provided as a resource to you. We're not necessarily providing the recommendation to conduct telepractice. It's going to depend, right, on your specific situation. And so we really do encourage you to consult with your government, your professional organizations, other ethical guidelines. Um, but if you do decide that telepractice and remote assessment is going to be in the best interest of your students, then we also ask that you spend some time practicing with these materials before actually sitting down with the students. So it's kind of a fun activity to do with a colleague, practice, practice, practice before, before attempting this with a student. Okay, so next let's talk about all the different skills that are measured within Ames Web Plus. So this is a list of all the assessments that are offered within Ames Web Plus, and they're grouped by benchmark composite area. The grade levels next to these composite areas, you know, they correspond to that benchmark assessment, uh, which remember is always going to be on grade level. Uh, for example, you know, your third grades students are going to be taking some from the math box and some from the reading box. However, if you do have kids that score below grade level, say for example, you have a third grade student that scores poorly on the reading benchmark and you realize that they are missing some of those early literacy skills, you have flexibility within the system to test outside, think outside of these boxes, and to do some assessments at lower grade levels to figure out exactly where the skill deficit is occurring. And that's where you'll set your progress monitoring goal. The other thing to know is that you're never going to give all of these measures to one student at one time. Uh, for benchmark, you're likely going to be pulling around three to five assessments from each of these boxes. And they're going to be prescribed to you kind of based on the grade level and time of year that you're taking that assessment. You can see that the skills are following kind of research-based skill progression. Uh, for example, they're, we're targeting all those big five areas of reading, phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, comprehension, and vocabulary. With math, we progress from kind of non-symbolic concepts to then adding in symbolic concepts and moving all the way up through computation fluency, finally focusing on application. We just, due to the time constraints today, I don't have enough time to show you an example of each and every single one of these assessments. Um, it would take quite a while. However, we do have a really good resource, our introductory guide that we can provide to you that has a screenshot or an example of each of these assessments and talks a little bit more in depth about what it measures and how we measure it. In addition to those academic assessments, we also have a behavior and emotional screening measure, the BASC-3 BESS. So this is something that you could add to your account. Um, it's a means to screen students for behaviors and emotions that might impact their academic progress, because remember, those are all very much related. Um, the teacher form takes less than five minutes per student to complete for a class. It'll take about a half hour to screen a class. And the results it gives you, it gives you an overall behavioral and emotional risk index score. And it also gives you sub indexes for externalizing risk, internalizing risk, and adaptive skill risk. In fact, you may have seen some of the questions before. Uh, the BAS 3 BEST is kind of a smaller subset of items that are on the longer BAS 3 form that a school psychologist or a school social worker may have asked you as a teacher to complete on a student before. So these are highly researched and validated items that make up this assessment. The other piece of data that you'll get from the BAST 3 BEST is it comes with validity indices. So when the assessment is over, we're able to make sure that the assessment was the respondent answered consistently and reliability or <laughs> reliably throughout that assessment and didn't seem to have an overall kind of negative 
opinion of the student while completing the assessment. So there's lots of really great data to make good decisions about providing behavioral and emotional supports to students. All right, the other option to add within your account is a dyslexia screener called the Shaywitz Dyslexia Screen. The Shaywitz is a teacher-friendly observational rating scale. Um, it's clinically validated screener for identifying students at risk for dyslexia. So that means it's been evaluated with clinical populations. It has great sensitivity and specificity, meaning that it can differentiate those that may be at risk of dyslexia from those that are not at risk for dyslexia. The rating scale allows teachers to capture what's going on within the classroom that might be warning signs for dyslexia. You can pair this with your Ames Web Plus results to take a really comprehensive screening approach. So Ames Web Plus is going to be that direct assessment of early reading skills associated with dyslexia. So how does the kid perform right now? You know, show me what you can do in one minute, go. That kind of direct assessment. The Shaywitz is going to come back and provide, you know, an assessment of what's going on the other 95% of the school day, what the other behaviors that the teacher is seeing in the classroom. And so we have a report that allows you to look at these two assessment results side by side to see which students are at risk on one or both of these assessments. And this will further allow you to prioritize your most at-risk students for follow-up and intervention because, you know, especially with dyslexia, that early intervention piece is key. Okay, so now that we have some background information about the assessment, um, the approach and measures, let's see how everything fits together within the platform. And so here is a screenshot of the Ames Web Plus home screen. Um, Ames Web Plus is kind of organized by three tabs, your students tab, group, and manage tab, where anytime you wanna do something student specific, like assessing a student or pulling an individual report, you're being the students tab. Um, your group tab handles that aggregate reporting data. So if you wanna look at your class, school, or district as a whole, you'd wanna pull a report from the group tab. And then manage tab is a lot of account setup type of things. Um, but the other main portion of the account is in the lower right hand corner of every page there's a little green button that says how can i help and this launches the online resource center so this online resources houses a wealth of information to support your team throughout implementation um, there are step-by-step -step guides with screenshots that are sequentially ordered from setting up your account, doing a benchmark screening, progress monitoring. In the other resources tab, there are our guides and our manuals. There's a video library that kind of shows how to administer some of the assessments. And then the other big component is for the kindergarten through first grade measures. So for those students where it's a one-on-one -on -one assessment with the teacher and the student has a paper stimulus in front of them, these paper stimuli are available kind of on demand here within the online resource center so they can be printed out here. And, or if you're doing a remote assessment, we have a whole section under other resources devoted to remote assessment practices that includes those video tutorials, the paper stimulus that are now converted to be presented digitally through screen share. Just a lot of information to support your teachers kind of when and where they need it most. So let's now show how we gather the data. And I mentioned there are two main ways we gather the data. We're gonna start by looking at the digital record form process. So again, this is used with your kindergarten and first grade students. And it's right within that home screen next to a student that hasn't been assessed. There's a little paper pencil icon and this, you click on this to launch the digital record form. And here's what the first page of the digital record form looks like. The form is going to tell the teacher or examiner everything they need to do and say for a standardized administration 
of the measure. So it makes it really, really easy to, to follow the rules and get really good assessment data. So the teacher is gonna sit one-on-one -on -one with the students. They'll put the paper stimulus in front of them. In this case, we're doing a letter naming fluency task for this example. So you'll put a piece of paper that has a page full of letters and the teacher will read the instructions and click begin. When you say begin, you click on begin and that's going to open up the scoring page. So on the scoring page for any fluency assessment, so anytime there's a time, a timer uh, with letter naming fluency, they have one minute to name as many letters as they can. You'll notice in the upper right hand corner, there's a circle with a number in it. That's your timer counting down. So the teacher doesn't have to pay attention to the time. They simply just follow along as the student reads the letters. And anytime the student makes an error, they'll click on that letter to, to mark the error. Um, if the student self corrects or there's a mistake in scoring, you can always click on the letter again to take that mistake away. And then when the minute is completed, it's going to prompt you to select the last item attempted. So in this example, Serena, our student, <laughs> made it all the way to letter D. So it puts a little flag where D is. Um, and this is the information that Amsweb Plus is going to use to score. And as I mentioned, everything's going to be automatically scored. And then your results sync right back to that home page. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about the results in, in just a minute. Uh, but before we get to that, I also want to show you how the data is gathered through the test nav process. So again, this is for your older students starting in second grade. So in second grade, all your students are going to take the majority of the assessments online through TestNav. First, the teacher is going to need to unlock the assessment. So by default, all the assessments are locked and the teacher will go in and unlock the students that need to take their assessment. This just gives the teacher more control about you know, when students are taking the assessment. We want to ensure that they're taking it kind of during a protected, standardized type of environment. So the teacher will unlock the assessment just before the student is going to take it. And then the student is going to log into TestNav with their username and password, which you can see um, are, are listed on this little screenshot here. Then the teacher will read a brief intro to the student and TestNav is going to walk the student through the majority of the assessment and the results are going to immediately, once the student finishes, populate back on the Ames Web Plus page. Now, a question I often get about TestNav is about accommodations. There are several accommodations that are available with, through the TestNav software. For example, Read Out Loud. Read Aloud is allowed for all students. Each student is gonna to have to have access to headphones while they're taking this assessment. They can have all the directions read out loud to them. The math assessments can be read out loud to them. The vocabulary assessment can be read out loud to them. Basically, any assessment where we're not looking directly at a student's reading skill can be read out loud to any student. Also within TestNav, there are several accommodations to help with visual impairments. So there's a magnifier you can use as well as you can change the contrast settings for students. So th there are a number of accommodations available for students with and without disabilities. All right, so let's get into the Info Plus reporting. So we're gonna go through several of the most popular reports. And as you do that, you're gonna see several numbers and scores. So I wanted to give you some background information as to where those scores came from. About six years ago, I believe, Ames Web Plus was standardized and normed, and that process included over 16,000 students, and those students were pulled from all geographic locations of the United States. You can look at this map here and see if your state happened to be included. And our norm sample was matched through four demographic indicators to the U.S census data. And so we matched our sample on gender, race, 
5%, ELL, your English language learners, and socioeconomic status. And so our standardization group, our norm group, is really comparable to the, the national demographics as a whole. So when you're seeing these national percentiles, you know you're comparing against a representative group of students. The other thing to mention is that we collected this data over the course of an entire school year. And so we not only have performance norms that we're able to tell you, you know, a score of 53 during the fall administration equates to a 40th percentile, right? The moment in time performance norms. We also have data to tell us what is typical growth across the year. So as you continue to collect benchmark data and progress monitoring data, you're able to see your students' growth. And with the growth norms, you're able to compare, is this growth closing the gap for the student? Is the gap widening for the students? You're able to make some really research-based and data-based decisions with this information. Okay, so the first report I want to talk through is one of our more popular group reports. It's called the Tier Transition Report. And if you can tell by the triangles on this report, it really aligns well with an RTI or MTSS model. And basically what you can do is you can pull this report for your group after the read. You can pull one of these reports for reading and one of these reports for math. And at the top, you're able to see your group's performance fall, winter, and spring. That's what each of those triangles represents, fall, winter, and spring. And it's going to tell you how many students are falling within each tier of the triangle. And so ideally, we'd like to see our green tier get larger over the course of the year, while our yellow and red tiers get smaller. We'd like to uh, close the gap and move students out of those interventions. Um, so this gives your RTI teams a lot of really good data to figure out are our tiers working as planned. Below the nice visual at the top, the tables in the middle tell you exactly how many students are in each of these little areas. It'll tell you how many and also what percent that is. So say your you know, MTSS team has a goal of 80% of our students meeting grade level expectations. You'll quickly be able to see what percentage is scoring in the green at your fall, winter, and spring benchmarks. Then if you pull this report for a class or a custom group, you're also able to see some student details at the bottom. So this will tell you exactly which students are falling within each of these tiers. This is really helpful for RTI teams as they're coming up with their small groups to quickly be able to see which students need to be considered for small and individual instruction. So this is a good starting point, thinking at a high level, you know, where do we need to allocate resources and which students may need extra support. But then we also have some reports that dive a little bit deeper into the concepts and skills that were assessed. So whereas the other one is looking at that primary indicator, that composite score, this math skills analysis report, for example, is going to dive deeper and look at specific skills um, that our class or group of students might be struggling with. So this here is a group report, and it allows you to see how your group is doing on skill-specific concepts fall, winter, and spring. So at the top, you can see there's three rows. Two of them have data in them. That's our fall, winter, and spring has not yet been completed performance. Each of the rows is focusing on a specific skill. So depending on what that benchmark, what the standards are for that grade level, it's going to break it down into different common core skills and domains. For example, you know, we might have three and four digit addition or subtraction would be an example of a skill we might see. Measurement might be another one we might see. And our group results are the green bars and they are compared to black bars that are the national average. So you can be looking at skill-specific data and know exactly how your class is performing to the national average on these skills. Now, if there is a particular skill that you're noticing your class is falling farther behind, you can expand 
that little graph as in the, the bottom picture, we've expanded one of these skills and now we're able to see student specific information. So I, I see that you know maybe there is an issue as a class. Okay, which students seem to be struggling with this skill? Across the columns are the test items. So for example, on the I think it's decimal multiplication on that specific skill, we had about eight items that targeted that skill. And for each student, you can see which items they got right and which items they got wrong. At the end of each student row, there is an overall percent accuracy calculated for, for that student. And at the bottom of each item column, there's also a, a group average. So you can start looking for some trends either at a, at a small group, large group, individual level. Um, what are some of the items that seem to be more tricky than others? And for each of these items, you can click on that heading at the top of the column, and you're able to see a screenshot of what the students actually saw while they were taking this assessment. So this assessment happens to be, you know, again, that online assessment through TestNav. We can go back and see which items were tripping them up and what exactly was going on there. If you look at a couple of those screenshots and start noticing some trends, hey, you built yourself a small group or large group lesson that really targets and reteaches what skills your students you know, need extra support in. So this is a really, really in-depth report that has a lot of instructional tools for a teacher. Going over to the individual reports, now we actually have quite a few other group reports. We just don't have time to get through all of them today. Let me actually circle back to this math skills one for just one more moment. This is actually also one that we offer an individual report for. So it has all the same data that this report has, but if you wanted to pull up this kind of information with a parent and not have all the other students' names and results on there, you can pull this report individually as well. Okay, moving forward with some of the more popular individual reports. The first one I'm gonna talk about is the SCORE snapshot report. This one is often used as a parent report. You can pull this one after the benchmark period. Uh, you could pull one of these reports for reading and one of these for math. And this just gives a really nice visual, simple explanation of how the student performed. So at the top, you can see the graph. We have the overall composite score. You can see the national percentile the student scored at. Then on the left, you have each of the individual measures that kind of falls under that composite. And you have your, the national percentiles for those as well. And they're nice and color coded so that you can see, you know, what green means average, yellow is at risk, um, orange would be, you know, well below average. The reason this makes a nice parent report is that there's this little narrative in the midsection that really interprets this graph for that for a parent. For example, concepts and applications, the narrative says it shows a below average understanding, so it interprets this data for them. It's below average understanding of important math concepts and ability to solve problems. If a parent didn't really understand what concepts and applications was referring to, Hopefully that narrative will help them understand a little bit more of what skill the student might be struggling with. Then at the bottom, this is an optional component to the report. You have a very simple view of the student's growth over the course of the year. So we have fall, winter, and spring performance compared to that national average. So this student, you can see, is closing the gap. There's their student scores are at the bottom. The national dotted line is at the top. So the student made some really great progress. So I talked a little bit about how we can dive in instructionally for math. So I also wanted to speak to kind of some of the instructional information you get for reading as well. So this is the skills plan report. And this one can be pulled following a reading benchmark. This is going to give you a lot of information about what kind of text the student does better with, so literary or informational text. 
It also gives you information on different Common Core domains that were assessed. So things like key idea and details and some of those higher order reading comprehension skills like predicting and, and things like that. Then at the bottom, and it's really small, I apologize. <laughs> uh, at the bottom, this is where it not only talks about a student's reading comprehension, but it starts weaving in some of those other assessments that we did as well. So how is the students, how does their oral reading fluency play into this? How does silent reading fluency play into this? What's their vocabulary? Is that possibly an inhibiting factor for this student? It has a discussion about stamina. because Some of our passages are very short, like silent reading fluency has fairly short passages where reading comprehension has longer passages. So you get some information about a student's reading stamina as well. Uh, so just a lot of different things to consider because reading is, of course, a very complex skill. So this gives you a lot of different ways to look, look at it. Now that we've identified the students that are struggling and we've looked instructionally and tried to figure out maybe what kind of support we should provide them, for these students, we want to be able to set some individualized goals that can match and track how well their interventions are working. So within Ames Web Plus, we provide a lot of guidance um, to setting individualized goals that are going to be challenging but realistic for the students. So these are gonna be individually set goals. That baseline score is gonna be either based on the benchmark or if you have to drop to the student's instructional level through what we call survey level assessment. If you have to drop down to their instructional level, that will be your baseline for setting a goal. Then the next box here that says target, we can monitor frequency. This is where you're gonna decide how long you want to set your goal for. So you have flexibility in the system to set a uh, two weeks all the way to 52 weeks <laughs> within the system. Of course, we're going to kind of provide some recommendations. Then you're going to choose whether you want to monitor this goal weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. Then moving over to the next box is where you're going to set the goal score. And this used to be the hardest part about classic Ames Web <laughs> was figuring out where to set a goal. But in Ames Web Plus, there's this really great feedback tool that as you make this goal more challenging or less challenging, there's a little, right now it's a yellow box on the right that's giving you feedback on that goal. And this feedback is based on our growth norms. So when we were on the slide with the map and I was talking about how you know, we gather data over the course of the year, so we know how students typically grow, that's what this feedback is based on. And so if you set a goal that is way, way, way too high, it's gonna tell you, you know, extremely ambitious, it's gonna tell you, you probably don't wanna set a goal here because you're likely setting the student up for failure. Um, on the other side of it, if you set a lower goal and it's giving you this yellow insufficient feedback, that's telling you that this is not expecting enough growth. And in fact, this is not going to close the gap for the student. Even you know, the gap is just going to continue to get wider if we set the goal here. So what we want to do is set a goal that falls in a, you start getting green feedback. It says closes the gap. That's where you want to most likely set the goal for the student. Now, of course, there will be special circumstances and there's flexibility within the platform to set the goal wherever you need. But this, for most students, is gonna be very, very helpful feedback. Then in the lower left, there's an option to tag an intervention to this goal. And so Info Plus doesn't come with any prepackaged interventions or anything like this. This is more something that can be customized to what you have in your district. Ames Web Plus is meant to be able to be used with many different kinds of interventions. And this is an advantage because as we're changing our approach to teaching a student, we need to have a consistent data source to see whether or not what we're doing with intervention A or intervention B is working better. We need to have that consistent data source. So this intervention assignment provides a really great documentation piece on the progress monitoring report. You'll be able to see which interventions were happening during uh, which time periods on your graph. 
And speaking of graph, um, here's an example of what that progress monitoring report does look like. So what's going on here is at the top, we have a very nice visual and this visual is very, very helpful to have in an RTI meeting when you're talking to a parent about the student progress, because it's just very easy to see whether or not they're meeting the goal, exceeding the goal, or, or not making enough progress. What we have here in February is we have our baseline performance and the bar in June, that vertical bar, is showing us where we set that goal. Now the little dots are your progress monitoring assessment. So as you continue to collect your progress monitoring, which again are gonna be those very brief assessments, probably one or two minutes, to really see where the student is going. As you collect a few points of data, it's gonna calculate a regression trend line. So this top line is our trend line, and that's showing us the track that the student is on. So if they continue making this progress, the student is going to likely exceed the goal in June. So visually, we can see, we can make some really great database decisions. You also have the raw data in the table below, and below that is gonna be the intervention log. So this tells you what's happening during this first intervention time. If in the beginning of May, we decided to make an intervention change for some reason, I mean, we probably wouldn't in this case, but <laughs> if we did, uh, if we decided to make an intervention change, we would log that, it would be logged below and you would see a line on our progress monitoring graph. Okay, so those are the major reports I wanted to be sure to show you today. Uh, we actually, as I mentioned, have a lot of other reporting options. I and mean, there are literally over a hundred ways <laughs> you could report this data. So if you are interested in seeing more reporting options, um, a representative follow up with you with our sample report document. It's really in depth and has all of our reporting options in it. But before we close out, uh, I wanted to discuss the professional learning options. So while we do provide a lot of training related resources directly in that account, one successful key to a good implementation is building in time and resources for professional learning. And so we have several different options that we can offer. Typically we'll offer on-site trainings. However, those are currently suspended due to the pandemic. So right now we're offering webinar trainings and a self-paced online learning academy. So our webinar trainings would be usually a half day webinar with a certified trainer. They'll meet with you prior to the training to learn a little bit about what components of the program you see, you know, that you really want to use and get to know your district a little bit so they can customize that training for you. The Self-Paced Online Learning Academy is learning modules that your teachers can complete kind of at their own pace and they can go back and reference throughout their Learning Academy subscription. So a lot of flexible options and since flexibility is key this year, you know, we'd be happy to talk to you kind of what might be best for your district and the number of people that you have to bring on board. You know, I just wanna close revisiting this concept of uncertainty that we talked about at the beginning. And as we discussed that existing infrastructure of RTI and MTSS is a great foundation to what we're going to be facing and we can face those challenges head on. And I think Ames Web Plus can be a valuable component of that approach. And so if nothing else, I just wanted to depart on a little bit of optimism during this incredibly challenging time that this can present some wonderful opportunities for progress. And so we have just about three or four minutes left. So were there any questions that we weren't able to answer or questions that came through that we think would be good to share with the group? Hi, Liz. Hi. There were quite a few questions about the remote assessment options in Ames Lab Plus, and I did get responses made to all of those, but I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that or if you want to need to, that's certainly fine. Yeah, I mean, Heather, you developed a lot of them. So if there are a couple mm -hmm. that you want to point out, that would be wonderful. Sure. In your presentation, Liz, you did point out that in our help area, 
of our account that you can go to the other resources and then go to remote assessment practices. And in there, we do provide a video that can be helpful when you're determining if this is something that you can do in your district and also all of the things that you might want to think about in regards to things like the student experience, you know, all the technology that a student needs when they're taking assessments at home. It also covers things from the examiner's perspective, including things like the technology and, and all that. So it is really a district decision and we recommend that you for sure review some of those materials and make sure it's something that's right for you. I know every situation is a little different, so take the time to look at that. So that um, I think should get you a good start. Just It really does take a lot of district conversations on how that will work specifically for you. Awesome, Heather, thank you. So I thank you all for attending and I do wish each of you the best as we begin another school year.